I'd like to call Dr. Furkan Ulhaq. Dr. Furkan, is he here? Okay. So the next person, Dr. Stephen Chirak Amin. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Savan from JJ Hospital. Uh, I'm presenting a talk on lateral condyle fracture of the humerus with posteromedial elbow dislocation in children, a case series and review of literature. So as you all know, lateral condyle fractures of the humerus are very common injuries in the pediatric age group. They are, however, rarely, rarely associated with dislocation <coughs> and literature is sparse. So we report a case series of Milch type 2 fractures with posteromedial dislocation of the elbow. So as we all know, the Milch classification of the lateral condyle humerus fractures, the type 1, where the uh, fracture line traverses lateral to the capitotelotrochlear groove, <coughs> and the type 2 where it traverses through it. So when it traverses through the groove, the elbow is unstable. Uh, and numerous management modalities have been described like closed reduction in K-wiring, open reduction and K-wiring, open reduction and K-wiring with a tension band wire, as well as open reduction and screw fixation. In our experience, open anatomical reduction is the crucial part. And fixation using a combination of screw and wire in our series is found to be the best method. So uh, these are the aims and the objectives of our study. And we also performed a review of literature on the subject, the functional outcomes using different management modalities for this type of injury. So uh, our case series was a case series of nine patients, seven male and tw uh, two, uh, two a female, all within six to 13 years of age. And uh, they were initially given a splintage and taken to surgery. So this was the inclusion and exclusion criteria of our study, which was the obviously to the pediatric age group study. We only included Milch type 2 fractures in our study and closed trauma. Uh, patients with distal neurovascular deficit, non-unions, malunions were excluded from our study. So this was the uh, approach we did. This is the operative pattern. We took the standard lateral approach. We opened all cases. The soft tissue that was interposed within the fracture fragments was removed and the frac fracture fragments were anatomically reduced and fixed using one K wire and one screw. And uh, closure was done if possible, because in some cases the swelling was very severe and we could not achieve closure. It was left open. Uh, post, post operatively, the arm was given a long arm back slab and suture removal was done on the 12th day. The K wire was removed at around 15 days post op and range of motion exercise was started after confirmation of bony union, which was usually around three weeks to one month. Uh, so here are the functional outcome scoring systems. The two that we used in our study was the Flynn criteria and the Mayo Elbow Performance Score. Uh, here is the Flynn criteria, which takes into account the cosmetic and the functional factors. <coughs> the Mayo Elbow Performance Score is a more comprehensive uh, scoring system, which takes into account pain, motion, stability and function and a total of 100 points. So this is uh, a case from our study. The six year old male presented to us with the Milch type two lateral condyle fracture with severe swelling. Uh, so severe that we initially suspected it might have been a compartment type injury. So we operated it open with, a, uh, with open reduction first. The fracture fragment was flipped on its head. So it, the articular surface was into the fracture line. We flipped it around and then we fixed it with a K wire and a screw. The wire was passed parallel to the joint line and the screw perpendicular to the fracture line so as to achieve compression. The primary closure was not, we, we were not able to achieve primary closure but we took tack sutures and uh, when the, the wound went on to heal secondarily. Uh, at around post update 12 we removed the sutures that we had taken and the K wire was removed at two weeks post op and mobility, mobilization was started after three weeks. So here's the follow-up. This is the six-month follow-up x-rays of this patient. As you can see, the uh, 
the wound has healed with a hypertrophic scar the range of motion uh, the flexion achieved is almost full extension is full uh, and as you can see there is no virus valgus deformity at the elbow here is a short video uh, so in such injuries there are a few treatment alternatives that we that have been described in literature the most commonly done is open reduction with 2k wire fixation and it has satisfactory outcomes <coughs> a tension banding procedure has also been described in literature uh, so these are our results the results of our study the mean time to, to surgery was 2 days and primary wound closure was not possible in 3 out of 9 cases uh, all went on to show bony union at a maximum of 6 weeks all mostly around 3 to 4 weeks and uh, mean MEPS was 91.88 which is an excellent score uh, here are the results of similar studies that are done uh, in literature so Cheng et al who did uh, ORIF with 2 KYS Tomori who did KYR and TBW combination and Rasul et al who did again with KYRs and Sharma also with 2 KYS so all of them have achieved uh, a good to excellent scores here is a review of literature the in, a, in multiple systematic reviews, they have found that complication rate is significantly higher in the presence of elbow dislocation, which is a main determinant of outcomes. So there are poorer outcomes in the dislocation group, obviously. And another systematic review revealed that open anatomical reduction is critical to avoid cosmetic and functional problems in the, these injuries. Um, so our study underlines the importance of open anatomical reduction of LCH fracture. No significant difference in functional outcomes in a two wire versus a wire plus screw combination was found. And multiple case series that were performed in the past in the 1980s, 1960s, they showed that they were attempted with close reduction, which showed very poor outcomes over the long term, which again underlines the importance of anatomical reduction. Uh, Pre-op planning by experienced individuals and not missing this injury is a critical uh, <coughs> is a critical step in management of these injuries. And due to the rarity of these uh, these injuries, studies are sparse. But still, we need more comprehensive studies and long-term follow-up. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Just come and collect your certificate. I'd like to call Dr. Kiran B.M. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Today I'm going to present you the topic related to the comparative treatment for the traumatic shoulder instability in young men patients between the orthoscopic bunkers and upper latangent procedure. As you know, uh, anterior dislocation is a frequent sport related trauma. It is accompanied by labrum, ligament, even bony lesions of the glenohumeral joint. In up to 67% of the cases, the con initial conservative treatment fails. Despite the operative treatment, instability still recurs in a young male patients. Uh, in a history way back in 1923, bunker repairs was uh, described, and in 1954, latest procedure was described. In the bunker procedure, is the most commonly used surgical intervention to treat the uh, shoulder instability. Here, the torn labrum and the inferior part of the anterior uh, half of the inferior glenohumeral ligament is anatomically attached to the glenar dream. Coming to the Bunkert's procedure, uh, in the first image it's showing the lesion over the anterior inferior part of the labrum. Uh, later the uh, lesion is curated and debrided and the edges are freshened. And the three uh, holes are made in the anterior part of the glenoid and the suture, suture anchors were passed inside it. Later the nodes were taken out to the labrum and it's tightened. So the anatomy of the uh, glenoid has been maintained. In spite of the bunkers repair, the dislocation rate may recur in up to 54% of the cases in 10 year follow-up. So in the recent years, letter procedure, there's a bony block procedure. 
is gaining popularity. It involves the dynamical transfer of the coracoid process along with the conjoint tendon to the lead neck. For these pro uh, reasons, the lateral procedure has been favored as a primary treatment modality for the traumatic anterior shoulder instability. Uh, for the briefing regarding the lateral procedure, the hostotomy team is made at the base of the coracoid process and the anterior inferior part is approximated towards the defect along the glenoid, part, glenoid wall and it's been fixed with a screws. The aim and objective of this study is to compare the success rate between the orthoscopic bunkers procedure with the open lateral procedure. The hypothesis is that the open lateral procedure resulted in the fewer complication compared with the orthoscopic bunkers repair in the treatment of traumatic shoulder instability in young male patients. Material methods, it's a pro we conducted a prospective study with a study population of 12 uh, cases. Inclusion criteria include young adult patients between the 16 to 25 years of age and the clinically documented instability using a positive apprehension test with a jobs relocation test. And uh, for the cases involving the involuntary dislocation, subluxation or the fear of shoulder dislocation of the primarily conservatively treated uh, traumatic shoulder dislocation. We did the preoperative plane film CT MRI was carried out and the CT is mainly used for the assessment of the bony deficiency in the glenoid. The enrolled patients were randomized into the group B that is orthoscopic bunkers operated and the group L that which is open lateral procedure operated. After the operation all the patients in were received physiotherapy after three weeks and the active exercises were started after six weeks and the force restricting activities were restricted up to the three months. The patient was clinically followed up at regular interval of three months, six months, one year and two years post-operativity. Intention to treat analysis were used to analyze for the primary and secondary outcomes. As you see the CT scan, in the first image it's showing an end phase view of the glenoid where you draw a circle along the board of the glenoid surface with the maximum diameter and between the edges of the defect a glenoid defect, you draw the tangential line. If the tangential line is more than the 50% of the maximum diameter of the circle of the glenoid surface, then it's a significant bone defect. Like in a similar way, you take an axial cut of the glenoid humeral joint, make a circle along the proximal humerus and draw a tangential line between the two ends of the hill sacs lesion. If the, uh, the tangential line is more than the 40% of the diameter of the humeral head, then it's a significant hill sacs defect. Coming to the results of the study, among the 12 patients, 6 were operated with the orthoscopic bunkers repair, that is group B, and the another 6 patients were operated with the open lateral jet procedure, that is group L. The mean age of the patients were 21.4 years, weight is 68 kgs, right-sided 2 among four, 6 patients in group B and 3 among 6 patients in group L. The one case in each the group has having hyperlaxity, and the 2 cases in the each the group is having the significant hill sacs lesion and the bony bunkers lesion. The competitive sports related activity was uh, having in three cases in group B and two cases in group B. Uh, one patient had a re-dislocation in a group B and the no patient, no dislocation happened in the group L. This case was subsequently reoperated with the open letter jet method. There are no treatment related complication in either group or no progression of glenoid arthritis. Coming to the conclusion, the orthoscopic bunker repair carries the significant risk of short-term post-operative dislocation rate and the need of additional surgery. The lateral procedure was associated with the higher rate of return to the previous level of competitive sports. Additional remplissage was inserted in the 40% and the in the group B and the 10% in the group L. The bunkers operation was repaired associated with the lower complication rate compared to the, since it's a minimal and invasive procedure. Despite the re-dislocation rate, the short-term patient-related reported outcome was similar in both the bunkers and lateral procedure. Limitations include the short-term follow-up and uh, you can't predict the when the instability occur, a young male patient and a female and older than is not included. Coming to the few. Thank you. Uh, before I give you your certificate, I think this is a flawed study because you're comparing apples with cabbages. Primary bank card for a primary dislocation is different and things where you have a big hill sacs and glenoid loss, that is multiple dislocations. You cannot compare these two. 
Yes, sir. If, uh, the come main and collect, come and collect your certificate. Vinay Sham Saman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, mechanical alignment has always been the dictum followed by uh, knee surgeons. Uh, having a joint line which is parallel to the ground and a neutral limb alignment is always what one desires out of a desire out of a total knee replacement. Yet 20% of this, uh, 20 percent is the dissatisfaction reported in uh, TKR patients. A part of which can be attributed to the uh, concept of constitutional virus, which represents a significant proportion of knees in the population, uh, uh, fitting the concept of perfect total knee replacement to knees that are not so perfect can be a reason for the dissatisfaction. Uh, that is when the concept of kinematic alignment was brought in, where we tried to uh, mimic the uh, native knee alignment during total knee replacement. Uh, it is associated with better intercompartmental pressure differences and uh, lesser soft tissue release or bony recuts are needed to achieve the same. Uh, but uh, while uh, uh, doing kinematic alignment, there are certain questions that come into your mind, like what, how can one predict the native knee alignment when arthritis has already uh, set in a uh, change in the alignment? Uh, second, what should be the target for kinematic alignment? Uh, that is when the concept of uh, CPAK classification was brought in. It uses a novel concept of arithmetic HKA, which is the hip knee an ankle angle and uh, joint line obliquity. Uh, arithmetic HKA is novel because it, uh, it, it is a reliable marker of the constitutional knee alignment irrespective of setting in of the arthritic knee changes. Uh, joint line obliquity uses used terms like apex proximal, apex distal and neutral uh, which uh, cleared the ambiguity which was present in previous classifications. Uh, this, the previous study was done in Caucasian population and hence for application of KA in uh, Indian population we needed uh, an Indian study. Uh, the objective of uh, the aim of our study was to uh, find the distribution of these CPAK knee types in uh, Indian scenario and to compare that between a healthy and a osteoarthritic population. We also uh, aim to find out the constitutional virus uh, in Indian population. Uh, we uh, studied 450 knees, 250 of which were osteoarthritic while 200 were of uh, healthy type. Uh, they were divided into two groups and each knee was classified using the uh, 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 procedure laid down by CPK classification. Uh, this is a short inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. Uh, we calculated, uh, we used uh, scanograms for this study, uh, limb, uh, law, <coughs> standing scanogram and uh, there were certain measurements that were made which is, uh, we uh, briefly calculated the LDFA and MPTA which is the lateral distal femoral ang uh, angle and medial proximal tibial angle. Uh, using these two angles, we calculated AHKA, which is the arithmetic HKA, not the mechanical HKA. Arithmetic HKA is the difference between these two values. Uh, now, if the arithmetic HKA falls between minus 2 to plus 2, it becomes a neutral alignment type. If it is less than uh, minus 2, it becomes a virus type. And if it is more than plus 2, it becomes a valgus type. So, AHK is a measurement of the uh, limb alignment. Similarly, joint line obliquity, uh, if the values fall between uh, 177 to 183, it forms the neutral type. Similarly, less becomes apex distal and more becomes apex proximal. Uh, now, using these two variables, uh, put it against each other, we find a nine CPK types matrix, uh, including uh, which uh, use these two uh, concepts that were introduced in the CPK classification. Similarly, we uh, classified our knees into this classification. It is a beautiful matrix uh, which is uh, which in which the knees that are depicted in each quadrant are the actual knees that we found out during our study. Uh, if we compare the demographic uh, comparison between the two groups, uh, the uh, osteoarthritic group uh, was uh, was older uh, with a mean age of 59. The female proportion was more in the osteoarthritic group. Uh, if we compare the alignment types in both the population, the varus alignment was uh, the predominant type in the osteoarthritic group, while uh, the neutral alignment was commoner in the healthy group. Uh, comparing the uh, joint line obliquity, uh, the apex distal type was the commonest uh, was the commonest found in both two uh, both the groups, and a similar distribution was seen in the, uh, with respect to joint line obliquity. Uh, now, uh, if we uh, compare uh, both the population, uh, if we compare the distribution of all these nine types into these two populations, we find that uh, the virus types, which are one and four, 
are commonest uh, in the osteoarthritic cohort while uh, the eight, uh, the neutral types 2 and 5 are commoner in the uh, healthy cohort uh, the four types 1 2 4 and 5 are commonest in the both the uh, study groups while the remaining have a similar distribution in both the study groups this is just a brief representation so the four commonest types seen in indian population are virus types 1 and 4 while the healthy types 2 and 5 uh, if we uh, compare the uh, the level of uh, virus types 1 and 4 it is more in comparison with the uh, healthy group so uh, uh, virus with apex distal that is type 1 and type 4 have an odd ratio of 2.8 in the arthritic group and type 4 uh, uh, has a uh, odd ratio of 2 in the arthritic group uh, whether having a native knee anatomy similar to the that of CPK types 1 and 4 which is virus with apex distal or neutral predisposed to knee osteoarthritis needs to be further researched and a deeper insight of knee dynamics in these high groups uh, need to be studied to improve uh, kinematic techniques. Uh, a important, important confounding factor here could be the older age group uh, that we had in the arthritic population as uh, arthritis and old age both have more common incidence of virus types but as we said that uh, we use the concept of AHK which is a predictor of pre-arthritic alignment and not the alignment which comes with arthritis. Second, uh, one important finding that we found out that uh, Bellman in his original study, the virus population was about 32% but in our study we found out that 48% of uh, uh, the Indian population had virus dynamics. So very high percentage of Indian knees are found to have constitutional virus. The high prevalence of constitutional virus in Indian knees may account for high prevalence of knee osteoarthritis and it being more common for Indians as compared to Caucasians. Uh, also okay, the aim for… You can uh, shift to the conclusion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so types 1, 2, 4 and 5 are the commonest CPK types found in Indian population. The virus types 1 and 4 occur more commonly in the arthritic group. And as uh, constitutional virus is common in India knees, uh, hence a kinematic approach caters to majority of the population. And further research is needed to understand which Indian knee types benefit the most from kinematic alignment. Thank you. It's an interesting study, but there's a one basic fact that there are two main cuts, the distal femoral cut and the proximal tibia cut. If you don't get those right, your knee is going to fail. Please collect your certificate. Well done. So, the next candidate, Dr. Dilipin Chakravarti. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge my authors. Uh, we have no financial disclosures to make. Pedicle screw fixation in osteoporotic spine is challenging. <laughs> Acute catastrophic implant failure can occur with screw pullout due to weak bone screw interface. Augmenting pedicle screw with cement or sublaminar wires is one of the way of increasing pullout strength. But there are some complications associated with these techniques. Cement augmented screws can have cement leakage and embolism and revisions are difficult with screw extraction. With sublaminar wires, there is a potential for neural injury with repeated passage of stainless steel wires. Wires can cut out through the soft bone and postoperative MRI are difficult to interpret due to artifacts. Sublaminar bands of polyester material are an alternate method for augmentation which does not have these complications. But the cost of these bands is prohibitive. Sublamin we try to find on cost alternative and thought of using muslin tapes. The first mention of use of muslin tapes is from 1986 by Robert Gaines who used in pediatric patients. The aim of our study is to assess the safety and efficacy of sublaminar muslin tape augmented pedicle screw fixation as a low cost modality for spinal instrumentation in osteopathic vertebral compression fractures. This was a retrospective study of consecutively operated patients for osteoporotic fracture at two centers with a minimum follow-up of 12 months. Only single vertebral 
osteoporotic fractures in thoracolumbar spine who were not operated previously were included in the study. Indications for the surgery were either neurological deficit or dynamic instability or both. All the patients were operated with the posterior approach with pedicle screw fixation two levels on either side. All cases uh, we did a transpedicular reconstruction of anterior column and the screws were augmented with sublaminar muslin tapes. Technique of muslin tape augmentation we used is as follows. After exposing the interlaminar space, a double loop of 20 gauge harsh sublaminar wire with one vicral suture crimped at the tip of the is, inter, is, uh, is inserted in the usual fashion. Then just the vicral is pulled out using a skin hook and sublaminar wire is removed. After that, two wet muslin tapes are simultaneously pulled back under the lamina with the help of vehicle as shown. Each muslin tape were passed over the rod around the screw tulip and both the ends were manually knotted with maximum tension. We noted this primary and secondary measures. Outcome of 40 patients were analyzed. The average age of the patients was 72 and an average follow-up time was 18 months with a minimum of 12 months and the, almost 80% of the fractures were T12 and L1. There are no radiographic screw loosening and pull out and no revision surgeries for construct failures. Our functional outcomes were satisfactory. We calculated the ODA, VAS score and neurological status. Out of 30 patients with neurological deficit, all except two recovered completely. We found an average 5 degree loss of correction at the final follow up. This cadaveric biomechanical study found that osteoporotic spine uh, screw augmented with tapes provided a better fixation than those without augmentation. Another cadaveric study showed that cutout, through, cutout force through the tapes was significantly higher than the stainless wire in osteoporotic bone. This is due to the fact that uh, force over the tape is distributed over a wider area than compared with a thin SS wire. We found one clinical study from Japan which has used sublaminar tapes for augmenting pedicle screw for osteoporotic fractures. In Japan, they use 90 centimeter long wires. Instead of uh, muslin, they use polyester material similar to muslin, but used a sliding knot technique and they used a tensioner to tighten the tapes. The limitation of our study is that we don't have a comparative group. We have relatively short follow-up with a limited number of patients. We don't have a follow-up CT and hence we cannot comment on the uh, decision of screw loosening and fusion status and importantly our technique has a potential flaw that we are not using a tensioner but judging the tension in the tapes by manually knotting them. Muslin tape augmented uh, construct relies on the lamina for its hold which is the strongest spot in osteoporotic vertebra uh, and it avoids a long implant construct and also avoids a cement related complication and muslin tape is a radiolucent material and does not affect the post-operative MRI. Thank you, sir. Well done. Um, so, have you compared the, you know, the complications of the failures you've had with your procedure to the Z-score of the patient? Uh, I mean, in that case, what I want to ask is, have you done the DEXA scans to declare that they're osteoporotic or to what extent? Yes, sir, but the osteoporotic fracture is itself, by definition, is a fracture. So, we are using DEXA scan uh, as a follow-up, sir. No, but what about what about knowing what is the Z score in all these patients before the operation? You know, to yes, to yes. see how osteoporotic they already are. Okay. 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 Sir. That that's I think something important. Okay, sir. But this is a good idea. You never mentioned about what is the actual strength of the Marcellin tape. Yes, sir. The actual strength of the muslin tape in, uh, is around 1500 Newton torque, sir. And what about the Dacron tape? Sir, Dacron tape is uh, 1800, but the cost is very high. The cost is about 25,000. Yes, 25,000 per And muslin tape? 2300, sir. So it's one tenth? Yes, sir, one tenth cost effective. Okay. But it depends on your strength that day. If you've had breakfast, it'll be a tighter knot. Yes, yes, sir. All Actually, right. we don't have a tightener to tighten. Sir. Next speaker, Rushan uh, Azaz Khan.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic for today is an assessment of functional outcome of surgically treated acetabular fractures. This conduct, uh, study was conducted in Cyan Hospital. So, uh, as everybody knows, acetabular fractures uh, have an indirect mechanism and they are usually high energy trauma. With the indirect mechanism, it is usually a blow to the greater trochanter, a blow to the knee, a, flex, a flexed knee and hip, and a blow to the foot when the knee and hip are extended. Um, if left untreated, displaced acetabular fractures can lead to development of premature arthritis of the hip and cause havoc in a patient's life. So the aims and objectives of our study was first to assess the functional outcome of patients that were treated with open reduction and internal fixation and also as a byproduct to study the rate of conversion to total hip arthroplasty for patients treated with for the same fracture in within 18 months. So our methodology was quite simple, single center study, a combined retrospective and prospective study. When the patient was admitted, we, uh, we, while prepping the patient for surgery, we give them a questionnaire and get the pre-injury Harris hip score of the patient. Then the per patient is taken up for surgery, open reduction internal fixation, and then the post-surgery Harris hip score is taken at six weeks, 12 weeks, six months, one year, and 18 months. So this was our inclusion and exclusion criteria. B basically, the inclusion criteria include, uh, included the acetabular fractures resulting in an unstable hip joint and excluded all the frac uh, fractures which resulted in a stable hip joint, like uh, stable non-displaced fractures, low anterior column fractures, low transverse fractures, even both column fractures with a secondary congruence were uh, excluded. So I'll explain the methodology with a simple case. Uh, this was a 52-year-old male with a history of road traffic accident uh, and as you can see from the X-ray and CT scan images, he suffered a post, uh, posterior wall of acetabulum fracture with a hip subluxation posteriorly. All of our patients, uh, 29 out of the 30 patients were operated using a lateral or a floppy lateral uh, position with the cocker Langenbach approach. And our implants used were a simple recon plate and screws. This is a post-operative x-ray showing good um, article reduction. These are the Jude views. So with the results, what happened with the results? Uh, so as we saw in our study that most of the fractures, uh, uh, majority of the fractures were posterior wall fractures. Then it, it happened mainly 86.7% in males due to predisposition for road traffic accidents in males. Uh, and then the Harris hip score. The baseline we took as 100, and as you can see, uh, over a period of six weeks, three months, up to 18 months, there was an increase with a mean of 88.57 at the end of the study. So there was a maximum increase in the Harris hip score uh, from six weeks to three months, indicating that at three months we have started the patient with the weight bearing. So uh, how do you interpret this uh, Harris hip score? Uh, between 90 to 100, it is considered as excellent. 80 to 90 is considered good. And 70 to 80 is considered fair. So uh, for a satisfactory outcome, we, we choose excellent and good. So uh, the second part of our study was to, uh, con to determine the rate of conversion to total hip arthroplasty as, because of the premature arthritis of the hip after, after a seemingly well reduction uh, of the fracture. This patient uh, at the end of 18 months developed significant arthritic changes as you can see and which required a total hip arthroplasty in the end. So in, at, at, the, at the end of 18 months we had a 3.33% uh, rate of conversion to total hip arthroplasty. So this interpretation we have seen. How, how does it compare with the other studies? Uh, from 19, uh, 1986 uh, starting from uh, Mata's uh, landmark study on functional outcome of the uh, functional outcome of uh, acetabular surgeries, uh, our our study was also at par with all the other studies similarly done. So at the conclusion, uh, we know that the fractures of acetabulum involve weight bearing joints of the lower limb. Hence, they must be restored as much as possible. Despite these best attempt, attempts, mal reduction and in inadequate fixation of acetabular fractures may occur. In those cases, 
total aparthroplasty may be needed in fracture when the primary fixation fails. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Sir, would like to ask any question? Well done. So I'd like to call Dr. Furkan if he's available. Dr. Furkan. So can conclude the session. Thank you. We finished early because there was one speaker less. So whoever's on for the next session can please start if they'd like to.